You know what? I'm going to start off by spoiling something huge. No, don't do it. They're not ready for it. Don't do it. They got to learn sometime, man. They got to learn sometime. Here's what's going to happen. <laughs> the Falcon is going to become Captain America, and then he's going to change his name to Captain Falcon, and he's going to go race on the F-Zero circuit. Oh, wow. You did it. You you know, it's funny. We would have never thought of that until you put those two pieces. You literally took two puzzle pieces that don't fit in the same thing, and you just like beat it mercilessly in there just to make it work, and I love it. Yeah, so thank you. They're thank fitting you. whether they want to or not. And then uh, mm. it's going to open up the Nintendo cinematic universe. And at the end of that F-Zero movie, Nick Fury is going to show up and he's going to say, I want to talk to you about the Smash Brothers initiative. And then boom, cut to black. There you go. It's, the formula works for everything. I mean, you could do it. That's why every movie's doing it. You know, that's why we're getting the real life Powerpuff Girls and guaranteed they're going to throw in another Hanna-Barbera character. And guess what? Hanna-Barbera universe. That's It's going to happen. It's going to happen. I'd be I'm actually trying to trying to connect the dots of who that other character of the Hanna Barbera universe would be, but I can't remember what crossover Powerpuff Girls has, but they did have one. I I never watched a single episode of Powerpuff Girls. I think it was a little bit after my time, but I would be totally down for a whole bunch of stories set in the Flintstones universe cuz I love it. Mm-hmm. And like do what they did with the Speed Racer movie for a Wacky Races movie. I would be all <sighs> oh, over that. Oh, wow. Yeah. I just want to see the dog laugh. That's all I want. <laughs> can you can you do the laugh? <laughs> yes! Yes, I knew it. <laughs> when they did it, when they did it in Reboot, I was like, oh, thank you. That's all I need. <laughs> oh, good times. Well, welcome to infinity rewatch this is the show where we rewatch infinity saga and then we re- we just talk about it's Marvel. it's the marvel show is what it is the, it's the title the title was a thing because we were rewatching, and now we're we're watching new things but still it counts and i'm andrew fantasia what's up i'm ryan j whitehead we're like the watchers of the marvel cinematic universe is what we are are we, I think that should be our tagline. Welcome to Infinity Rewatch. We are the Watchers. We are of the, the Marvel Watchers. Cinematic Universe. Are we? Are we yeah. more like the Watchers or like the Watchmen? Oh no, we're the Watchers, man. We want to be like Watu, yeah. man. We want to just watch and just be amazed, you know? Yeah, I think you're because the Watchmen are really messed up people, and it's like they are. Yeah, they're they're there's some pretty bad people, man. I mean, there's some good people, but they're but for every good one, there's an equally bad one. Mm-hmm. And the watchers seem like they're just more, you know, they're just chilled people. They just kind of sit around on their moon base, not getting haircuts because they don't have any hair and just being like, look at that human. I can't believe he slipped on that banana peel again. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, you know, it's, it's but that's the rule, man. The rule is to to watch and just let the events unfold as they are because they learned their lesson. We we read that in that awesome timeline book I have, the Marvel timeline book. It's so good. But um, yeah, Watu broke that rule and then caused a series of, of unfortunate events. But that's the rule of the watchers to let the events unfold as they may and they are to watch. It's Uwatu's fault that we have COVID-19. He's the yep. one who started it. Yeah. <laughs> confirmed <laughs> hashtag he's sorry hashtag. or it's sorry the who it's who just confirmed it right now yeah it was all because of uatu the watcher nice <laughs> going buddy <laughs> but you know what i will say man speaking of world building i mean this i will tell you guys something in this episode is something going on in falcon and winter soldier that is completely beneath the surface and it's and it's so far below the surface that I don't think we're gonna see the the fruits of its labor till like till till probably secret invasion. Oh my god, I I love that. I love that. That just wrinkled my brain because there's man, is there ever a lot going on in this episode? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I'm gonna start with a stupid question that I had because. I think they've already answered this question for us in the films, but I honestly can't remember. Vibranium. Is it magnetic? Can you, does magnets do things? Okay. 
Because yeah, this this was I feel like this episode is the first time ever that Marvel gave me a sense of exactly how the shield works. Like this is how it it is thrown, and this is how he manages to catch it all the time. It's it it's some kind of like like the flubber thing that vibranium's got and just throwing it kinetically hitting it with something causes it to bounce back at the same trajectory. So you can kind of play this little geometric game that has never really been clear in my head. I, it always just felt like magic. Like he throws it and it comes back like, like Mjolnir, but this kind of cemented that it's more of a uh, physics thing. And I like that. I like that. I, I feel like I know the shield and how it works more now than I did off the top. Mm. I, I like I like how you're saying that. I mean, we have seen examples in the Marvel Cinematic Universe of, of its magnetism. Um, for example, in Age of Ultron, in the first the first battle scene, which is one of my favorites, um, the 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 famous Whedon one shot action sequence, um, and uh, and in that fight scene, you see Cap bring up the shield to his hand because there's a magnet attached to it Um, another example in black panther uh, when they're mining the vibranium and we see um we see uh martin freeman's character uh first seeing wakanda for the first time they talk about the magnetic system that they use to mine the cars and, and move around them move around the vibranium you're right yeah that whole the monorail that shuri's got underneath in the mountain there uh, that's it uh, yep so magnets magnets are key all right good to know good to know so mm-hmm. i i feel like this really and there's something that you are going to talk about here in this particular podcast ryan and i feel like this is a great way to sort of kick that off because now that i know 100 percent that it is magnetic and that it is just you know a normal guy like sam can throw it and catch it just based on the way the shield works really makes yeah. me feel like this is not the shield is not something that is uniquely suited for Steve Rogers. The shield is meant to be wielded by multiple people because it's about being more than just one person. It is. It is about being more than one person. And I think this episode really does a great job of demonstrating the symbolism of cap of captain America, not Steve Rogers, the, the, the identity of Captain America. Um, and uh, and the great thing about it is, speaking of the shield, I think the shield, I think what the actors have done is given the shield a character. Um, and as someone like yourself who really appreciates like all, like the environment having a character, you know, like Gotham is a character. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the cool thing about seeing Falcon use the shield in this episode um, you actually see him struggle with catching it a bit more than the other characters. When Bucky catches it, he can catch it with one arm and not be flinched. When uh, when Walker does, he really throws his shoulder into it to really put emphasis into like all his moves. Um, even all his attacks require him to really stretch out and throw his body weight into it. And it's not that it's heavy for him. It's just that the the aggression he puts into his movements where caps all about technique it's all easier for him to to throw it um because like he knows the technique because he's used to it right um when sam throws it you see he always tries to catch it and he has to lean back yeah. otherwise it's 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 gonna probably take his head off but he has to absorb the momentum a little bit to, to catch it so it's kind of see it's kind of amazing to see all the the all the different actors use it in different ways to give this shield life in terms of using it in action sequences and stuff and that's a great trend uh segue into that first action sequence we get i mean we take we end episode four with this kind of incredibly dark shot and and marvel's really going the distance here marvel um proved with wandavision that they can be creative but they also proved with falcon winter soldier that they can push the envelope and sort in in terms of tone you know what i mean like it's Mm -hmm. not it's no longer this kind of like like it's no longer this kind of like oh it's good versus evil hurrah no it's 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 this it's this a real 
survival of good, I think is the probably the best way to, to, to describe this experience that we're going through with these characters. It's not about good versus evil anymore. And I love how, I love how um, Strucker says it, you know, it's not, it's not a battle, you know, it's not uh, a battle of heroes anymore. It's the age of miracles, right? But now it's it's just a battle of survival. Like that's the that's what Thanos brought to the table. It's a battle of survival. And now with good versus evil, it's like okay, if we're gonna survive, who's gonna help lead us to that survival? And good's really struggling to get there. And that's why I, I love where it just where we start. We end with this shot of Cap Shield and blood. And we start off with this incredible fight scene, like right out of the gate. Yeah, you're right about this. Like this good versus evil thing is, it's funny because I went into this show uh, just assuming, just being a dumb old jerk who assumes stuff. And I was like, I assume I said this out loud in my, by myself in, in, in my empty house. I was like, I, I assume that Baron Zemo is going to be the villain of this show. And my empty walls echoed back silence at me. And I just continued assuming that. And then after this episode where Zemo kind of gets carted back off to the Wakandans to face justice for what he did to to T'Chaka, I kind of sat back and I'm like, he's not the villain. He is like, this is the dark world and he's Loki. Like he's just there for the ride to do something. And, you know, they didn't want to work with him, but they didn't really just have a whole lot of choice they were just truly desperate to come to him and now he's going back behind bars and it's time to deal with the real threat and i thought that was a really interesting thing because it shattered that assumption that i had finally and now i'm just like is this even a story that has a villain or is it just about how wrong you know how how these systems of the american government have been so wrong that they have created people like flax masher and people like us agent who are, you know, doing more damage than they are good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're kind of just. I, I agree with you. I think they're 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 the products of they're the consequences of good versus evil, right? Like because now they have their own visions of who's right and who's wrong, and they have their kind of own morals, um, which is great because what we're seeing now with the Marvel world, which I think DC does very well, is is what is the conclusion. What is, what is, Mm -hmm. what happens after, right? What's the after effect of all these battles, right? Um, And Flag Smasher, I think is, is interesting because, you know, it's one of those things where I I think Sam's got the right approach. Like Flag Smasher is not wrong, but they're, what they're doing is wrong, but they, they, their opinion is not wrong. Um, And it's, it's, it's interesting to see how, how these players are all coming together. And that's, I think what it is now it's, it's this going back to the fight, good versus evil. It's not about that anymore. It's just about how these characters are all just living in this world and slowly come together. And then what happens when these forces collide and then that causes a battle, you know what I mean? Like it's, it, they're no longer just identified as like, okay, clearly, you know, this person's wearing purple in a giant black trench coat with fur. This person's evil. It's not, it's not that simple. And, and in fact, I think, I think Zemo plays more of a mentorish role in this than a villain because he's trying to keep everything honest. That's, I think that's the beauty of it is, is he is keeping everything honest. He's just keeping it real. He's not playing games. He's doling out some Turkish delight. And then he runs, yeah. he runs for the sewers like a Ninja Turtle because he knows when yeah. when uh, the 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 fan is being hit with turds, so to speak, and he wants to get out of mm-hmm. there. And uh, uh, the like the fight that happens here, man. This if I I don't know the name of the person who directed the upcoming new Mortal Kombat movie, but if I was that guy, I'd be shaking in my boots because this fight, this was a raw, brutal, bloody fight. Uh, unlike anything I think we've seen so far. And it makes sense because these are three guys who are uh, like two of them are jacked up on, on serum. One of them is just a normal dude doing his best. And all three of them walk away just like dripping blood. Winter soldiers like spitting blood out of his mouth. It's nasty and beautiful to look at. And a wing gets pulled off. Like, Oh my God, this is 
This oh, fight, wings. Man. Oh my god, it's it's violent. This is a violent fight, and you know what? I think Marvel really learned something from Daredevil because the fighting in Daredevil is probably the most gorgeous fighting I've seen since Winter Soldier, and I think I think Daredevil elevated it a bit more. Now, to be clear, um, you're talking about Charlie Cox, right? You're not talking about Ben Affleck yes, on a seesaw. I'm talking about okay. the Nef- the Netflix Daredevil. Yes, yes. Thank you for clarifying. Because that. that seesaw um, fight, I think, I think everyone was. I think everything was. I think everyone was with me on that. Yeah. I don't think anyone else is thinking, except for maybe Ben Affleck. But I don't think anyone else is thinking the other Daredevil. But um, but I think that I think that the Russos really found a good fight choreographer that enhances what a superhero fight should look like. Daredevil took it a grittier step further to make it feel like, like when the hero was taking a beating, the hero was taking a beating. Um, And in this fight, um, these guys each dish out, you really feel each move, which to me, as someone who enjoys fight scenes, you really, you really enjoy this fight. Like you, you get the stakes of each character. And what I love about this fight too, is again, it's not about them fighting each other. It's them fighting for the shield and, right. and what the shield mean and, and who's and fighting for what the shield means to that person. Right. Um, there's actually a small beat in, in that fight scene Um, I took note of this, actually. Uh, There's a small beat in this fight scene where you see Bucky just like have a moment with the shield. Like he just like as if as if like he's just he knows that they all like everyone has let Cap down. Yeah. Like everyone. And and even at the end of the fight, Sam has the same thing with the blood. And, And it's it's beautiful. It is absolutely beautiful. And what I love about. Wyatt, uh, and it's funny, he really sounded like his dad when he was screaming at uh, when he was screaming at the two of them. <laughs> um, but what I love about Wyatt in this is that when you see it, in, like I said, when you see it in his hands, he's just like throwing this power because he goes around being like, I'm Captain America. I'm Captain America, right? Like he just goes around with such arrogance. And the beautiful part is, is they have trouble ripping the shield off of his hands, which I thought was really interesting because like to Walker, he is like, he's holding on to that shield so tightly because it's, uh, it's all about that shield is his identity now. And if you rip it off of him, you're literally tearing off his arm. So that's, I thought that was interesting that they literally broke off his arm, like literally broke his arm doing it. Somebody sent me an image. I don't think it was you. Somebody sent me an image like yesterday of uh, Mm -hmm. like three or four different images of Walker where he's saying I'm Captain America and like, hi, I'm John Walker, Captain America, like variations of that throughout the show. And then Mm -hmm. next to it, three or four images of Steve. And he is saying, I'm just a kid from Brooklyn. Hi, my name's Steve. I am Steve Rogers. And I thought like that summed it up so well. Like he's just this humble dude. And he's like, look, I'm not trying to be this guy with an A on my head running around like a dancing monkey. I'm just, I'm just the guy from Brooklyn trying to do the right thing. Cause I don't like bullies and I'm a good man. And that's it. That's it. That's it. And that's so beautiful to say, right? Like he always admits that he's just a guy from Brooklyn. And, uh, and when the government puts him out there, he's captain America, right? Like mm-hmm. that's, that was the whole idea. And it's, yeah, it's so beautiful to see it. And it's interesting to see like, you know how Bucky knows he can't be Captain America. He just he knows it. He admits it. Um, and Falcon should be Captain America, but he's reluctant to take the the spot, and for good reason. And we get into some interesting stuff later on about that. Um, so that was really cool. And so that fight scene was amazing, and it tells a lot of story uh, through just the fighting itself, which is, in my opinion, when you're doing a fight scene, if you can pull that off you've got yourself an incredible fight scene. And you know what's interesting too? Like we, uh, we've talked before about how like MCU has been so good at doing things that when you look at what Marvel would do in the past, you're like, oof, like we've come a long way. I recently, just yesterday, I started replaying a game, Ryan, that I haven't played in like 13 years and that's Marvel Ultimate Alliance, the first one. Oh, All right. fantastic. Game. I haven't played that since like 08 when I bought it. Um, I love that game to pieces. Uh, but when you start the game off, 
you've got your 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 core team, and on that core team is Captain America, right? Now, the voice actors in this game are doing a, a fine job, and you know they all sound cartoony. They sound like they're coming right out of one of the animated series. When Captain America opens his mouth, though, when he starts talking to the team, he's talking like this. And yes, Captain America is here. And let's go stop the Winter Soldier. And Hydra's here, too. And I'm just like, that sounds like John Walker. That doesn't sound like Steve Rogers. The the Chris Evans Captain America is so good at being what Captain America should be that that guy from Brooklyn, that persona he gave us, of like just the guy from Brooklyn doing his best, was so perfect that now I can't look at this other Captain America with a straight face anymore. Cause I'm like, this guy is the dancing monkey. This Captain America in the video game is just that like for freedom and Liberty. It's like, dude, what <laughs> you're not real. <laughs> you know, people don't talk it, like that. Yeah, yeah no, I, I see where you're coming from for sure. I mean, it, it's, it's hard to find. I think it's, I think why Chris Evans is so brilliant is I agree with you. There's a, there's a serenity to this character. Yeah. It's it's really, it's it's not about you know filling your diaphragm so much with air that when you speak it's just like pure authoritative. It's not even about that. It's this guy, you know, and it, it goes to that funny funny story I may have mentioned on this podcast before. But um, when I was in a job interview for for Microsoft. They asked me who my who my one of my like inspirations were, mm-hmm. and I said I said Captain America. Now they were they were expecting like oh yeah my last manager or like somebody like this. And I legit said Captain America, and they laughed at first, but then they asked why, and I'm like well because like this guy like this guy is a leader in the sense of like he will take the best idea and then lead lead that person to execute said idea, right? And so. I mean, I like the writing of Captain America in Marvel Ultimate Alliance makes sense to me because if I were to look at those lines, yeah, when he lands on the ground with Hero, first of all, he's called out of nowhere. Like literally, Nick Fury's like, okay, we're going to, you know, get you guys out here. And all of a sudden he's with Thor, Spider-Man and Wolverine, just like that, right? <laughs> and at first you're looking around, you're taking it all in and it's just war all around you. But Cap knows exactly what to do, right? Like, and, and they'll they'll look to him naturally. He doesn't bark out orders. Everyone looks to him and they did it. They did it the best in the first Avengers movie because when they all land on the ground together and they're surrounded by aliens, the first thing that happens is Iron Man looks to Cap and says, call it Cap. Like they don't, Mm. he doesn't take charge. He waits for them to look to him to take charge. You know what I mean? It's reaction. So I agree with you. Yeah. It's not about being authoritative. It's, it's about he's the only one who understands war and understands what to do, right? So he is, he's supposed to be that symbol of hope. And yeah, I agree with you. I think when Chris Evans does it, there's, he's never barking orders. It's always like, uh, you know, like the speech when he, in Age of Ultron, when he's just like, you know, if you get killed, walk it off. Like yeah. it's, that's, that's the guy, that's, that's the way you deliver confidence. It's about like, Okay, he always is like, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to, you know, I'm going to get the Howling Commandos and we're going to go take out the, you know, thing. And he's like, well, I'm going to need a team, so I'm going to get these guys. Like, it's never, I'm doing this, this is my way. And we're seeing the opposite. And I love how you're saying that. We're definitely seeing the opposite with John Walker. And I, I what I noticed is there's a lot of uh, interesting criticisms about John Walker's outfit because yeah. uh, being the Star Spangled Man... Uh, he has uh, red and blue on his suit, but he has no white. And uh, the white actually in the American flag represents that purity and that like the, uh, I guess the, yeah, the, the purity, the innocence. Um, and, and he's lacking that. So that's interesting. Yeah. We really see the contrast now that we get to hold this other captain up to the light. Mm-hmm. We really see, I mean, like he, in when he's talking in his everyday life when he's walking down the street with Battlestar and they're talking about like, what should we do next? He is talking like how Steve talks in those videos that they showed at Peter Parker's high school. Like it's so phony. It doesn't feel right. And I think they're really nailing that. This is a persona and he doesn't understand really what it is to be cap so much. So that guess what the Senate is revoking his rank 
He has no rank anymore. He is not getting any benefits. Uh, turns out man with nice beard from Smithsonian is a senator. He's, uh, he's the senator who's taken away all the power that he bestowed on U.S. agent. Mm-hmm. And that scene, that was like a, a Game of Thrones level scene of like just him standing there on that trial. And he's looking the senator in the eye and he's like, you made me. And you can tell he's even during this professional, like in this professional environment, the dude is like ready to just explode. He's a loose cannon, man. Mm -hmm. You know, it's funny. When we got that scene, I was really hoping to see like Senator Kelly. Like I think, I think Marvel had every opportunity every opportunity to put in like senator kelly and then kind of have like those kind of conversations but again it's hard because you i think when you're dealing with these film stories uh, or sorry these when you're dealing with these comic book stories in a film-based setting you have to be very careful to don't add too much because and i'll explain why and it's a great segue to get into um is because if you add too much people in the in the back of the theater, as my brother would say, there's, there's not enough going on. And I think Marvel's being really smart right now. And that's why I'm saying there's a lot going to be happening underneath the surface here, but on the surface, you're just getting this incredibly rich story about the meaning of Captain America as, as, as the, the persona. That's the word I've been looking for the persona, Mm -hmm. as opposed to just Steve Rogers, you know, as Captain America. Um, So, so yeah, no, it's a beautiful scene. I, I, but I really think that would have been kind of cool to kind of have Senator Cal- Kelly in there and just, but play them strictly as the senator and not throw in too much. Uh, Maybe he. Then, you don't know his last name. Maybe he is Senator Kelly. I don't think they've said his name hard, yet, have they? Man. I don't think they have either, actually. But maybe we'll keep an eye out for that as we do this, continue through this podcast. Um. But yeah, uh, I but I would love to have seen that. And also, I was surprised that we didn't see General Ross uh, either. There's another missing character here that I feel like is is has to play a card in this in some way, shape, or form. And we do get a small nod to it because we get Zemo going off the Wakandans back to the raft, which we know is where Ross resides because we last left him there as running the raft. So there is there is something going on there, and again, this is one of those things where it's the, underneath the surface. But um, wait, are you talking about yeah. William Hurt Ross or Martin Freeman Ross? Oh, good point, uh, Ross. Uh, William Hurt Ross. William Hurt. General Ross. General Ross. Thunderbolt. Okay, so he's he's in Wakanda too. He's just running the raft. No, no, no. no. The Wakandan said they were going to take Zemo to the raft. Yeah. So, so the Wakandans are actually working with the government, which I thought is interesting. Is Thunderbolt like? Is the raft his thing? Is that his domain? That that technically is his domain, but that's also where he kind of does. That's where he assembles the the Thunderbolts, which I feel like you were gonna, which which I feel like you were gonna say, but then you kind of backpedaled there a little bit. Oh, okay. So he gets his criminals from there. Okay, all right. That sounds interesting. Yeah. Because now the pieces yeah, so. are being moved. And, you know, they made a point. They made a point of having the Dormelage say, we're gonna, not just we're going to take him to Wakanda. We're going to take him to Wakanda. Pause. Look in the camera. To the raft. Yeah. <laughs> I hear is a very thundering in the raft. We will mm-hmm. bolt him into his restraints. And he will have a hard Ooh. time getting out. And she just keeps hitting Winter Soldier in the ribs. Huh? And he's like, I don't know huh? what you're talking about, lady. <laughs> Huh? no yeah so so well but still my point is is like the the certain it's like chess certain pieces are being moved into certain spots and we're getting we're going to see a confrontation or a reaction happen so i really feel like they're going that way mm-hmm. um now that which brings me to my interesting tie-in which we have to talk about the big cameo Elaine! which i leg- I, I had a big gasp like there was a moment where i was like <gasps> And, and Isabel is like, shut up. I haven't seen the episode. I don't want to, I don't want to know. And I'm like, I'm just like, oh my God, like freaking, oh man, Louise Dreyfus. Like what? I, what? I have a huge crush on Julia Louis Dreyfus. Um, I thought when I saw her in oh, Seinfeld. Ju- yeah, Ju- yeah, Julia Louise Dreyfus, yes. When I saw her in Seinfeld, when I was younger, I was like, this is a beautiful woman. And like, she's so 
I love her. I love her to pieces. I could not, when I saw those boots, I was like, who is this? Whose boots are these? Who are we looking at? I, what's the deal with Elaine, man? Who is this? This, this duchess. I, I didn't even write down her name. I just wrote Elaine because oh, I was man. having a fit. What's her deal? Oh, buddy. So first of all, first of all, first of all, when I saw those boots, I, at first I'm like, oh, they, they brought back the therapist. Okay, that makes sense. Like the therapist would clearly come in at a time like this. Uh-huh. And so again, talk about clever writing, buddy. This is right up your alley. They really subverted expectations because they just totally went for a, a cameo appearance. And this is the f- this is the this is one of the big surprises that actually paid off because we heard about it in the social media where again you know we obviously got conned in the first one with WandaVision but this time around this was actually real this is a real rumor that paid off um so she uh, so okay Julia comes in and she sits next to Walker and she ident or sorry before she sits next to Walker she identifies herself as La Contessa Valentina Allegra de la Fontaine. Oh my God. Hold on. I need to write that down. La Contessa Valentina Allegra de la Fontaine. Did you know in real yeah. life, Ryan, she is royalty in real life. Like she is like a, like a duchess. Julia? Yeah. She's, um, I forget what she is. She's either like a duchess or a countess. Like she's something like that. Um, so I, no I, way. when she's, when she referred to herself as a countess in the episode, I was like, oh, they're doing like a little meta thing here. Kind of. That's- oh man. The meta is real. My friend, <laughs> let me tell you. So who is this lady? Uh, oh my God. Okay. So where, first of all, where to begin? Um, <laughs> Okay, so the best way to, to talk about this. So she was created in the 1960s. She's oh. she's like a golden age character. She's, she's, OG. she's from Stan's time. Mm-hmm. Okay, she's from Stan's time of writing. And she uh, was introduced as a S.H.I.E.L.D. agent alongside Nick Fury. Uh-huh. Okay. All right, so you're with me so far, right? She actually became the love interest of Nick Fury for a while. Ooh. Now... Here's what the interesting part comes in. All right, you ready for this? Yeah, I'm ready. She she turned out to be a double agent. She actually worked for Hydra. And so she like infiltrated Shield and tried to get all this intel. And then not only that, she earns the trust of Hydra and then she becomes a triple agent. And she's actually a member of the Leviathan. I've heard that, but I don't know what it is. Okay, the Leviathan I have mentioned before, mm-hmm. um, and uh, and so uh, okay, so the Leviathan is the group that runs the Red Room. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now they run the Red Room, and they're like they're like the uh, the black market of Marvel. Like they're the they're the Russian black market essentially. Um, now the cool thing is is that that yeah she, she's an agent of leviathan now her character actually is pretty famous um her character has carried on through the years okay you ready for this oh my she, god she she uh during during certain events um she uh tried to spy on nick fury nick fury however being the most paranoid person on the planet uh after even with her being like his love interest and everything he actually tries to kill her. He and he wins. He gets her. He goes. He gets her. He kills her, and she turns into a scroll, thus kicking off the events of the secret invasion. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. Holy cow! All right, now talk about talk about underneath the surface. Okay, she kicks off the events of the secret invasion, and after the death of Captain America. Uh, she another scroll agent picks up the same identity and approaches Dum Dum Dugan with the intent of learning the location of Nick Fury because Nick Fury's missing at the time. Um, she actually stabs Dugan uh, with claws resembling Wolverine. Get out of here! I I am not making this up, man. This is facts. This is facts put together. 
Um, and so she also was an, a huge, huge part of the Secret Warriors, um, which is also a really, really good story. Um, so that that's really fun. And that also involves Captain America. So that was really awesome to see her in there. And this is what I was what I was going back to with like, there's so much going on beneath the surface. The other interesting thing is um, the internet has been talking about this. And apparently, during the Black Widow stuff before Falcon and Winter Soldier, it was confirmed that Julia was supposed to be in Black Widow. Oh, you heard this? Before today, like you knew about her being in it, in Black like Day? there was rumors that she was in it before today. Wow. Okay. And then I was talking to my boy Stephen, whose best friend's mom is the director, and he was <laughs> saying the same. He was saying the same thing. Yeah. He, Stephen, we love you, buddy. You're you're an awesome, man. Lived li you've lived an amazing life, and I hope you keep on living with this amazing life. Um. And yeah, so he was talking about that too, and um. But again, but like I said, we got it from the internet first, but my, my, my buddy was saying the same thing. Like, yeah, from the internet, she's supposed to be in Black Widow. So my guess is, my guess is, is she's going to be working with the Leviathan and, and she's going to talk about some secret agent stuff, essentially. She's going to have probably play more scenes similar to the one we just saw, um, just Julia being Julia. Uh, and what we're going to see is she will probably kick off the events of Secret Invasion is my, is my theory. Dude, that is so cool. So she's basically like a an evil Nick Fury, just going around recruiting people. And yeah, I th and I think she does a great job because you kind of see her being like Nick Fury in this scene. Mm -hmm. She shows up. She's got her leather jacket. She's all mysterious. She doesn't really have like a name name. She's got a card with nothing on it. This <sighs> Elaine. I'm so I could just watch a whole series about Elaine's character now. This is this is fantastic. Yeah. Wow. Um, it was it was a huge cameo. I legit gasped out loud. I was like, <gasps> <laughs> now is she she's her, her name is a mouthful. Is she from like a like a Marvel country to have such a, a big name? Like what is she, who is she the countess of? Oh man, I, I couldn't tell you. Okay. <laughs> Uh, but I, she's she's been affiliated with so many things. Like, yeah, she's she's also affiliated with a group called Janus. Um, which again, it's kind of hard to hard to describe, um, but like like Zemo and all that. She, yes, she's a part of like this royalty, not not Zemo's royalty, but she's like part of the you know this kind of underground evil royalty. Yeah. She goes to the same parties as like Meghan and Harry. She's rubbing elbows. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. Wow, Contessa. Oh, I love it. I'm so happy uh, with mm -hmm. this character. She's mm -hmm. got a little purple hair. She's got like purple Psylocke hair. I love it. I love it. I mean, people were betting on Mystique. I mean, classic Marvel speculation. I mean, people were going crazy of what this like secret cameo could be. I think it's perfect though, because this character has such a uh, key, such a key thing, key element to a lot of big stories. So we're going to see how that plays out. Oh, this is very exciting. Oh boy. All right. I'm glad we know more about the Contessa now, because I was just, I spent the whole day just like, who could this be? But just like happy that we were getting Elaine in a show. So beautiful. Uh, now, speaking of beautiful, but on a less positive note, I want to bring mm -hmm. up something that Flag Smasher said, um, okay. or that Carly said, rather. Is it Carly? I feel like I always mess her name up. It's Carly, yeah, uh, Morgenthau. Carly Morgenthau, thank you. Um, she said something that I think is very timely, uh, very sad, very timely, but it really hit home. It really hit me. So I jotted it down where she's talking with her homies there. And she says, how many times do we have to pay with our lives just to be citizens of this goddamn planet? That that really got me. That was a powerful, powerful moment. And it's it's so true. Like there's there's so much going on, not even just with the Flag Smashers, but with all the people in this universe and in our universe who have to end up dying because they're just trying to live. And we saw that happen with, with this guy. I wish I knew his name, her buddy who got killed because U S agent was just a big old jerk. Uh, and he even lied to Battlestar's family to their face and said, yeah, that's the guy who killed your son. Like, uh, like that, just that moment I under, 
stood her anger. And for the first time throughout the show, I was like, you know what? If she's throwing bombs around at this point, I'm, I'm with her. I'm with her. Like she, mm. I, I, before this moment, I was like, I like her, but I think, you know, cooler heads need to prevail here. And now I'm just like, let her do what she wants to do. Like, I get it. Yeah, I, I, I have to agree with you. I mean, it's such a powerful line. I think Marvel has done an incredible job finding these writers and really creating these real stories. But more importantly, um, they're doing what the Marvel formula has been for a very long time, which is, which is um, always aligning itself to the social climate um and uh and trying to trying to marvel always has tried to highlight history by making by making uh or by basing real events into their stories so um we actually do get to see another example of that which i will talk about um but yeah i i couldn't agree with you more i think um this is why i think it's like no longer about good or evil because it's just not that simple it's not that simple at all it's it's really it's really this kind of uh, it is about understanding. And I, I always get worried about that because like in terms of storytelling, because, you know, I always fear that the villains get too justified, but this is not the case. This, this person's not a villain. This person's not even close to a villain. Um, this person is doing bad things. Yes. But their ideology, like I said, with, with Falcon earlier um, is they're not wrong. They're, they're absolutely not wrong. Like they're, they, and even the actor, actor who plays this character, she's been saying like, she's, she's fighting, she's fighting for something that's right. And so I agree with you, man. Uh, and I, I, I have to give props to Marvel, man, but they're, they're living up to the, the Marvel way, which is always taking these historical events and, and really kind of just working it's working the marvel story into it and i think it, they do it in in in, the, in this way because it really brings a lot of education and a lot opens up the opportunity for people to kind of talk about it um which which i will segue into uh the the isaiah bradley story um yeah let's talk and, about isaiah uh, yeah i i I love it. I, I love what they're doing. Um, of course, you know, they can always dig a little deeper and 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 really bring out that story. I, I hope you guys kind of see what I did there with the Disney thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I will say that they, they do need, they could dig a little deeper and talk about it. Um, and I love that what Marvel did was they're talking about Isaiah's Bradley story. And they're talking about uh, events that actually happened in World War II. Um, he said that, uh, yeah, you know, I used to be like you. Uh, and, you know, I was all about, uh, I was all about, uh, you know, repping the, repping the Red Tails 332. And, mm -hmm. and that's an actual military group. Yeah, the Tuskegee that, that, Airmen. That exists. Yes, the, Tus the Tuscany Airmen. So what I love about this is, again, Marvel is doing a great job actually using historic events um, to create the opportunity to create a little education and learn about it. And I recommend you guys check it out. I mean, there are some great articles about it and there's a lot of great history. So um, it's definitely worth taking a look. And uh, I just I think it's a great way to do, uh, like I said, a great opportunity to educate and keep uh uh keep that conversation going and and really bring up these these topics and and again it's it's about being like being good right being like being service to people and that's what captain america is all about right and and i love isaiah bradley's perception of captain america i think it's it's a it's it's again it's just not it's not that simple it's it's not you can't do it that way and it's amazing. I, I, I absolutely love, I, I texted to you and I, I will say it this way. Marvel is just going for truth and heart right now. And it's, it's very brilliantly beautiful in, in, in a really, um, uh, taking a really difficult topic, but, but making people aware is, is really just amazing stuff. Yeah. This show has been doing that a lot with this talk with Isaiah, mm -hmm. with the bank, with what Flag Smasher said, it's really eye opening. Yeah. Uh, and I think it was, God, is it almost 10 years ago now? George Lucas made a movie about the Tuskegee Airmen called Red Tails. Uh, it's, mm -hmm. it's a very 
cheesy, like super Hollywoody kind of movie. It actually, I feel like the people who wrote it and like George Lucas just produced it. He didn't direct it. I feel like the people who wrote and directed it have never Mm -hmm. seen a movie before. So the movie treats anything that you would see as like the biggest cliche ever. They approach it as if this is the first time you've ever seen anything like this. Uh, But it's, it's a, it's a cool movie to like to watch and like all the actors are great and it's educational. I learned about the Tuskegee Airmen from watching Red Tails and I'm sure you can learn even more. That's not like Mm -hmm. Hollywood pap stuff by checking out like the actual history of it. But yeah, I, I liked when, when he name dropped uh, the group, I was like, Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. This, that was a nice little touch. It was a nice little touch. And I just want to say one of the biggest accomplishments, accomplishments, uh, more, more recent accomplishments, accomplishments. I don't want to say they're biggest cause they have, they have a lot of big ones. Um, but one of their more recent accomplishments is that they, the mint, the U.S. Mint is going to issue a, an American beautiful quarter commemorating the Tuscany Airmen, a national historic site. The coin depicts a Tuscany Airman suiting up with two P-51 Mustangs flying overhead. And the motto, quote, they fought two wars, which is beautiful. They so, fought two wars. That. that is beautiful. I like mm-hmm. that. Uh, you know who was in that movie? Uh, David Oyelowo, who is uh, the voice of... Agent Callus on Star Wars Rebels, and he's got nice. a he's got a new movie coming out like in a month, I think, that he directed and starred in. I wish I could remember the name, but it looks like mm-hmm. a, like a fantasy movie. It looks really cool. But yeah, he's yeah. he's a cool guy. He's uh, he does a great job in it. I think Michael B. Jordan was in it. Cooper Gooding Jr. Like it had a beautiful cast, nice big ensemble cast. Yeah, and uh, the other thing that interests me, uh, going back to Isaiah Bradley, is are we going to see the grandson suit up and become the Patriot? Um, That's right. You said he's a guy too. Yeah, he's the Patriot. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, like we see, you know, not to jump ahead, but we see U.S. agent making another shield. So uh, the, the America's going to be swimming in shields, Ryan, by the end of this series. Yeah, everyone's it's, suiting up to wear the stars and stripes, man. That's uh, which is which is interesting because again, it brings to brings to light, you know, everyone you know out there in the world could say like, oh yeah, like oh I, you know, if I were given the super soldier serum, I could be Captain America. It's not that simple, yeah. and it's it's it does it. That's not how it works, um, and and I love it. I. I I think, and that's the beauty of what I what I love about this episode and and the show, uh, and what Marvel's just doing overall because they're 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 doing this kind of interesting fourth wall break in terms of like talking to the fans uh, in a fun way in a fun way in the sense that it's like oh yeah you know you think it's easy to suit up and be Captain America but is it and they do the same thing with Spider Man and it's it's it's. Even even Iron Man, like uh, almost all the characters, it's all the, done the same way. Is like, it's it's you can't just put on a suit of armor and say you're Iron Man. It, like that's and that's why I love in Spider Man Two. There's that scene where he just breaks down. He's like, everyone's expecting me to the the next Iron Man. He's like, and I love how um, Happy Hogan's like, nobody can be Iron Man. Not even Tony. Not even Tony. Mm-hmm. And that's because he's like, that's not how. That's not that's not what happened. Like you know what I mean? Like it's not. Tony couldn't do it. You know, he's just, he had to be Iron Man. Like that's just the way it was. So that's, that's the beauty of what Marvel's doing. And I, I, I am so along for the ride. Like I, this is, and this is why, you know, people are like, won't won't you get bored with Marvel? I saw this brilliant Instagram post and it was, I wish I saved it. And I said, I wish I sent it to you. It's like Marvel is talking to their fans directly. Like every, like, here's an example. They were all like, oh, Marvel's been telling the same story over and over again. The fans were starting to all feel that way. Oh, we're kind of starting to see the same stuff. Boom, WandaVision comes in. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, and then everyone's like, oh man, I love this Zemo scene. This Zemo's awesome. Yeah, we love Zemo. They give you an hour long content of Zemo dancing. Like (laughs) they're, this is, this is proof. These are two small, two small and most recent examples of, of marvel is listening marvel is listening to their fans but the beauty of their content is that they're making you feel like you're a part of the conversation and that my friends is brilliant film production you cannot you cannot duplicate this you can try to replicate it 
but you cannot duplicate it because you know why? Because Kevin Feige is as much as a fan as we say we are. And he is the only fan to go out and prove it. Do you get people often asking you if you're bored of Marvel? Like, does that happen to you a lot? I actually do. I, I, I actually have had some people say like, you, like, come on, man, you're going to get bored of this stuff eventually. And you can't, you can't, this post, this post was so brilliantly put together that you can't. And another example, the whole Mandarin thing, we all flipped out and you even brought it up today. You brought it up, but let me put it to you this way. Uh, the Ardridge Killigan thing, like everyone was super upset. What did Marvel do? They retconned it. They come out with a one shot and say that was not the real Mandarin. You can't just put a tattoo on your chest and call yourself Mandarin. It's not, that's not how it works. You can't do it. And you can't have a fiery hair that makes it look like you look like the man. No. No. Sorry, Nothing. Chief. Not going to happen. And I, I don't understand the people who, who say like, oh, won't you get bored of Marvel? It's like, like think of like pizza. Like you don't have pizza every day, but yeah. when you order pizza... You order pizza and maybe you're going to put a different topping on it. Maybe you're going to put the same toppings on it because you know what? You love those toppings so much. And every time you eat those toppings, you have a good time. So it doesn't matter if it's like a pepperoni and cheese, like Falcon of Winter Soldier, where it's everything you love, but it's just classic and you love it. And like, why would I spoil a good thing? Mm -hmm. Or maybe it's like crazy spicy meatball with peanut butter, like WandaVision, because, you know, you want to be different and you want to be quirky but it's still delicious. Nobody's ever going to be bored of pizza. Hi. Nobody ever gets bored of pizza. Nobody's going to be bored of pizza. Let's like, go. There's my fiance coming in with her Marvel cameo. We just got a Marvel cameo, people. We just cameoed Mephisto confirmed. Like you're, you're not going to be bored. Like who's bored of Marvel? It's like, oh, more orgasms. Oh boy. Like, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I don't know what else to say to that. That's it. That's, that's it. And it, let me, let me put it to you this way. Cause like, I want to be fair here in the conversation. Let's talk about Star Trek. Okay. Mm. Fans are all, you know, fans are all, I've had fans like that be like, oh, won't you get bored of Marvel? Star Trek hasn't stopped. Star Trek has come out with different types of Star Trek mm. that caters to different audiences. And it's brilliant. Like this, what they did with Discovery was really good, and it was it felt it felt like the most fresh reflection of the social climate, and gave you a Star Trek story with that. And I think that's that's great, like awesome. Give me more Star Trek like that. Now, let me approach to the 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 more poppy culture, the more mainstream culture, if you will. Now that Marvel is mainstream, though, it's unfair to say. But let me talk to the mainstream culture. Grey's Anatomy. How many seasons have we seen of Grey's Anatomy? How many? How many? And you still watch it? You still get excited about it? There you go. How can I get sick of Marvel if you're not sick of Grey's Anatomy? Like, let's let's get real. Okay, let me stop you there. Let, let's CSI. How many CSIs are there? You know, there's billions, gazillions of them. Do you get sick of them? No. You love it. You crave it. Right? And like, for example, my fiance loves, uh, you know, uh, what's it called? Um, oh my God. Why am I freezing on this? The podcast. Oh my God. So, uh, it's the stay sexy and don't get murdered people. Uh, I don't know what that is, but I like that. <laughs> I like that. Is that their sign off? That's their slow. That's their slogan. That's their, that's the, kind of like their tagline. So is it like um, a true crime one? If they're talking about getting murdered? It's, it's a podcast about murders. It's, 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 um, Oh my God! Why am I freezing on this? Ah, <laughs> uh, jeez, I hear it all the time. Anyway, let's, let's think of what, is, what it should be called. If it's a maybe, it should be called like podcast in the first degree. The murder party. <laughs> the murder party. Um. Yeah. No, it's two ladies. They do this incredible podcast, and I'm just gonna. You guys will all just if you're if you're if you're subscribing to this, you can put it in the comments. Yeah. Whatever. Let me know. Anyways. They talk about murders all the time. They've been doing it for years and have so many stories. And someone said, like, aren't you ever going to run out of stories? And of course, like, they, they, did, they did the most honest yet accurate line is like, no, like, there's always murders to talk about. But they, they do create a wonderful world of conversation to talk about it because they, they just tell you these stories. And some of them are cringy. Some of them are hilarious. Some of them are... Some of them are scary. Like it's it's all there. But my point is, is like there's they have so much content that you can't help but just get more. 
You know what I mean? So will I get sick of Marvel? I think you said it best. I'm not, <laughs> would you be sick of orgasms? No. <laughs> oh man, again? I just have one. God. God. <laughs> oh yeah but anyway so yeah to summarize awesome uh the episode is is great overall and and we get to see um that cameo was just groundbreaking and so what's interesting though is we you know the flag smashers are going in they're gonna they're clearly going to attack this council um and i love how they kind of have like a hydra motto one world one people like you know what i mean like everyone if you're gonna be a, a um you're gonna be an organization. You gotta have a catchy line. So yeah, you know, that council Hydra is like the room where that council meets. It looks like I don't know if you've ever seen the room where FIFA has their like the 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 board of executives of FIFA where they meet. But it looks no. like where a James Bond villain would sit around his table with the people. Mm. Like when I saw that council, I was like, if Flag Smasher is gonna blow them up, I feel like I'm on her side. <laughs> I don't trust any of these people around this table. <laughs> Uh, right. I mean, and again, what's interesting, though, is she's going to a room where people control decisions, right? Yeah. So what better way to infiltrate is to do that. And um, what I love about the I always thought when I saw that scene in the trailer, I'm like, oh, man, that's clearly like a Red Room thing or maybe that's like a Hydra thing. But it's obviously a Flag Smasher thing. Also, I love that we're getting the Leaper again. I love that they've made this this like D great character so relevant and awesome. I thought he died. I thought he I died also. I thought he no, I, I thought he died too, but it clearly he got captured. But um, yeah. but I'm glad that we're getting him come back now. Clearly, uh, Agent Thirteen is definitely deep undercover with something. I think she's probably with the power brokers. Is my guess. They, but but again, I don't know. I mean, so far we we clearly know who the players are here. We got the power brokers, flag smashers, and then we got the uh, the Avengers, and then that's and then the U.S. government. Essentially, those are your factions yeah all coming together so we're gonna see what's gonna happen from there um uh, but we also get an ah uh, well okay so one more thing i want to point out is i love seeing the downtime i love when you see the mild bannered version of these characters um i love the bucky loving the sister thing and I, I thought that was cute um also i just i love the joke that he's like why would you just use your metal arm and he's like oh you know i don't <laughs> always think of it first i'm, I'm right-handed like that that's that's the worst thing to happen to you. I mean, I would I would try to be, and this is, as a fan, this is the conversation I'm talking about. I would try to become left-handed, but I'm a naturally right-handed person, so it would suck to have a left metal arm. His delivery on that was perfect, man. He's just like, yeah, I, I don't think of it because I'm right-handed. Like, it was so, that's so Bucky. That's not going to be the new spinoff. That's so Bucky. <laughs> Yeah, they're building a yeah. boat, man. Boat building montage or boat renovating montage. That was so cute. Just the three of them playing some music, renovating a boat. Like, beautiful. We didn't get bored of that. Nope. Didn't get bored of that. It was beautiful. It was so fun to watch them have this natural dialogue. The chemistry of those two actors is just absolutely amazing. It's so fun to watch. Um, and then, so, yeah, so we get this in, all this stuff in here. It looks like, again, now all the pieces are in place. Sam gets a suit or gets a case. I think it's his new wings, obviously. It must be. Yeah. Um, the vibranium wings because clearly his wings broke. And then Bucky's like, yo, I know people where they make unbreakable things. So clearly uh, I think we're going to get see some vibranium wings, which would be pretty cool. My question is, is the, does the suit come with it? Or is he going to make a new suit? And my question is, when he handed him the case, why didn't Bucky say, take these broken wings and learn to fly again. fly again. Learn to live so free. And Sam's like, I'll do that, man. Thank you. Yeah, I'll do that. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, man. So, so yeah. And then, so now it feels like all the, all the pieces are in place for what's probably going to be the craziest episode. I think we're going to get probably 30 minutes of action and then probably another 20 to 30 minutes of story. Yeah, but gonna... I'm saying like, I'm saying like it's pure action for 30 minutes and then like the rest is story. This is going to be a Rondo in New York, man. This is a big, big deal. Um, whatever's going to go down next week, I think it might be safe to say it's going to be something that like the the MCU world talks about 
moving forward. Like they always talk about the Battle of New York. I think this might become known as the Second Battle of New York or like New York mm. 2.0 or something. I just there's something about the establishing shot they used of NYC. It was so ominous. It's like now that we're here, you know there's trouble. It's almost like when you visit New York City in Marvel now, you know it comes with a an asterisk of like there will be fights. Someone yeah. will wreck something. Um, I, I'm I'm excited, but I'm also scared because I don't know, I don't know what's gonna happen. Honestly, it's so funny. It makes me think every time I see like, oh man, there's gonna be this battle in New York or whatever. I know people out there are like, man, I'd love to live in the world of Marvel. No, mm-hmm. no, you don't. They got planet eaters. The, the world's on fire every other day. Like, <laughs> yeah, no, thank you. The world of Star Trek, I'd gladly live in. Post scarcity oh, future. Yeah. yeah, you can just hop around, go warp speed, visit other places, find beautiful green women, and make friends with them. Yes, please. I mean, I mean, beam me up. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, for sure. Well, on that note, that has been episode five of the Falcon and Winter Soldier, the penultimate episode. We have one left. And I just hope Elaine's in it. I hope Elaine is just like watching the fight and she's like, hey, it's me. Could you not? <laughs> could, you, could you not? I know, um, you, I know you're fighting the Flag Smashers and, you know, Christine Everhart's coming to annihilate us, but could you not? That's that's going to that's gonna take place next week. Guaranteed, lock it in. I, I definitely don't think... I definitely don't think this is the last we've seen of this character. I think we're going to see a lot more. I did see, I did see an article saying that they were that that this character is not planned for more things. But I think with Marvel, you can still be creative by saying we have a plan. We're not going to add on that plan. Yeah. So I think that's not the last we've seen of her. And in my opinion, you know, that's the second best Marvel decision, the second best decision Marvel's ever made. And you know what the first is? The first is subscribing and listening to Marvel's Infinity Rewatch. Well done. Well done. I love it. Yeah, here's our card. There you go. <laughs> it's it's black on one side, it's white on the other. You can just keep whichever side up you prefer, you like to look at. Maybe you want to get... Uh, Want to lighten up your room a bit? You turn the white side up. You want to look cool? Turn it around the dark side. There you go. It's not going to say our there names. There you go. Because our names are, are the, you know, you don't need to know them. You don't need to know our names. <laughs> All you need to do is like, subscribe, comment, and have a marvelous day. Hey, scumbags. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up on our video. As always, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, Rebel Scum Podcast, for all the latest videos.